Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our Monarch Butterfly Program. My name is Peggy Simonson. I am a member of the Board of Directors of the Chicago Living Corridors. And uh, for those of you who were with us last month, please bear with me, but I'd like to introduce the people who are new with us this month to uh, who the Chicago Living Corridors is and we're the sponsor of these programs. Whoops, went too fast. <laughs> Get my program here. Um, our mission is to focus on property and private ownership, um, which is most of the land in Illinois. We uh, we align with the the public ownership, like, such as the forest preserves and so forth. But uh, we're wanting to encourage and inspire a residents to plant native plants on your property, and then to map that uh, land. So we can, we have an, a, a way of looking at how much good habitat there is in the Chicago area. Uh, we're an umbrella organization that was founded by Citizens for Conservation, which is a group that I am with, uh, and we have a program called Habitat Corridors in the Barrington area, which helps people uh, improve the habitat on their property. The McHenry County's Wildflower Pro Propagation and Preservation Committee has a mentoring program, which it does the same thing in the Northwest suburbs area. And then one of the other founders was the Conservation Foundation, which has the Conservation at Home program, which is now expanding to a good deal of the Chicago area. And the other uh, founders were the Northern Cane Wild Ones and the West Cook Wild Ones, which also have habitat improvement uh, programs for their members in the area where they are. Uh, so, uh, in addition to our founders, uh, we have other organizations participating. And if you have good habitat, if you're developing good habitat on your property and would like to get on the map, we don't do it by individuals, we do it by organizations. So, uh, these are the organizations that have uh, worked with us to get their um, participants' properties on the map. And uh, this is what the map looks like. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see the, the legend here, but if you're interested in more detail, go on to the chicagolivingcorridors.org website, and uh, you can see on the map the different colors are the different organizations. And on the, on the website, it's interactive, so you can, you can indicate a particular uh, color and determine which the organization is that had those properties. Uh, the one I'm with is, is, is Citizens for Conservation is the green here uh, in the Barrington area. The Conservation Foundation is, is, in, is headquartered in Naperville, so most of their properties are there, but they're getting spread obviously all around. So in any case, each uh, of, the, of the participating organizations have colored dots on the map. And uh, it's an interesting way to, to, to take a look at what's going on, how much property, how much private property is being built into good habitat in the Barrington area. So uh, we're, uh, with that background, I'm going to uh, move on to, uh, first of all, let me just give you some of the technical information. Uh, we're starting off with everyone muted, except for the presenters. Um, and we've built in some time at the end of the program for questions. Uh, and so at that time, well, in the meantime, if you have questions as we're going along, you should have a, a, a little box on the, on the bar of, of your screen that says questions and chat. And you literally can write your questions in there as, as Debbie is speaking, and then we can pick them up at the end. We'll also unmute uh, people at the end if we want to have more discussion. Uh, if, if you have any technical issues as we're going along, please also submit those uh, under the chat. That you, you can't say them out loud, but you can, in fact, uh, express the, the issues and, and maybe get some help that way. And finally, we're recording today's uh, webinar, and we hope to be able to post it on the Chicago Living Corridors website. We did that after the last month's program, and um, I think we're, we're intending to send an email out to all the registrants so that you will know when the program gets uh, posted on the Chicago Living Corridors website. If you want to take a look at it again or want to share it with someone, you, you'll have the resource there. Um, it's, it's actually a video that's being presented, put on there. So now let me introduce Debbie. Our speaker today is Debbie Grote 
Her career was as a Spanish teacher, she says, for 34 years in the Barrington schools. Uh, but her avocation has taken, she's been, that's been driven for the last 10 years by her interest in monarch caterpillars and butterflies. She raises monarchs in her yard in the summer and encourages others to provide food and habitat for monarchs. And it wants to have everybody help this iconic butterfly continue to thrive. She's been involved with the McHenry County's Wildlife Propagation and Preservation Committee for 15 years. And she says she was a member of the first mentoring class in 2005. And as I mentioned earlier, the WPPC was one of the founders of CLC. So we're really pleased to have uh, Debbie with us tonight to, to share her wonderful uh, program and valuable information on the life cycle of the monarch butterfly. So Debbie, up to you. Well, thank you very much. It's very nice to be here and thanks everybody for joining us. Um, I became interested in monarchs uh, as a participant in the WPPC's mentoring program. Uh, I, did, I was a gardener, but I didn't know much about native plants. So uh, I was assigned a mentor who uh, taught me a lot, of, a lot about native plants and it's kind of like field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. But in this case, it was if you'll plant it, they will come. So of course, among the native plants that I had was milkweed. And we know that milkweed is the one thing that monarchs absolutely have to have. So if you learn nothing else tonight but this, uh, it is that you need to plant more or plant milkweed or plant more milkweed. The uh, milkweed plant is the only plant that the female will lay her eggs on and the only plant that the larva or caterpillar will eat. So you absolutely have to have milkweed in your garden. And I'm trying to, there we go. Okay, so um, <clears throat> this is a, a sign that we have in our garden that uh, represents the WPPC, the Wildlife Pre Preservation and Propagation Committee, and encourages anybody going by to plant native plants. And it kind of answers questions of my neighbors, I think, as they walk by and wonder, what are all those things growing in her yard? Of course, you recognize milkweed. Everybody has probably childhood memories of milkweed. Um, and I think when I was young, we did consider it a weed. And I can remember my mother saying, you know, get rid of that stuff. I don't think she would say that today. This is common milkweed or uh, Asclepias syriaca, and it pops up everywhere, it seems. So I hope you'll let it continue to grow. You know what it is. It's that plant with uh, the pods and the uh, that split open in the fall. And then the seeds are blown by the wind. And I can still hear my mother saying, quit blowing that stuff all over the neighborhood. We'll have milkweed everywhere. Today, I'm sure she would say, go ahead, blow that milkweed everywhere. If you don't like that milkweed, you might prefer this milkweed. Uh, there are hundreds of kinds of milkweed, but only a few that grow in the Midwest. I have four in my yard. This is butterfly milkweed, which is Asclepias tuberosa. It's much lower growing, and unlike the others, it's orange. It only grows to about, about two feet. But the butterflies, the monarchs still love it, and they will lay their eggs on here, and they will nectar from these plants. Or you might like uh, rose or swamp milkweed, which grows pretty tall, but has a more delicate leaf. And again, they will still lay their eggs on there. So uh, in addition, I guess the one, as I said, I want you to know about planting milkweed or more milkweed. And the other thing I certainly want you to take away from this is that in addition to milkweed, you need to plant nectaring plants because the butterflies and all other uh, insects need that nectar. So milkweed itself is a great nectaring plant for all kinds of uh, pollinators. This is the orange milkweed. Even the lowly dandelion is a nectaring plant. You see this red admiral on that no, on uh, dandelion. So this is just to give you an idea of what other nectaring plants you can you can plant in your yard so that not only the monarchs but other pollinators have access to them. This is a liatris. Uh, this is a delphinium. And of course, you see all different kinds of insects. 
In the fall, it's really important to have asters and goldenrod and other fall blooming plants because as the monarch starts its traveling from Canada all the way to Mexico, it needs a lot of energy and those are fall blooming plants and those are common to this area. So that's another great plant to plant. Uh, purple cone flowers are great, even sunflowers. And of course, in addition to nectar, it's the pollen that the bees are after. And that's, uh, he's collected quite a bit of it there, as you can see. So again, nectaring plants in addition to the milkweed. This is a um, hummingbird moth on Monarda. So back to monarchs and milkweed. As I said, they are, uh, they use them to plant, to uh, lay their eggs, but also to gather uh, to nectar, to get the nectar. The egg is laid on the underneath side of the leaf. So on a common milkweed plant, it's pretty easy to find that egg because those leaves are big. Um, the egg is small, but the leaf is big. But if you're looking under the other milkweed leaves, it's really more difficult because there are many more of them and they're very narrow. But this gives you an idea of just how tiny that egg is. You'll find other insects lay their eggs there also. So once you learn to identify a milk or a monarch egg, it's pretty easy. They'll also lay them on the buds of the flowers. And when magnified, this is what it looks like. And you can actually see maybe with a magnifying glass those striations or those lines and it will be sort of shaped like a chicken egg sort of with a flatter bottom and a pointed top and when you see that pointed top turning black this is a very bad picture that i tried to take through um, uh, a microscope with my iphone but anyway you see that the uh, top of the egg has turned black. That's the head of a tiny, tiny little caterpillar inside that egg, and it's about to hatch or emerge. Now he's out of the egg. He's turned around. He doesn't look like a monarch caterpillar at all right now. It looks like a big black head with no stripes, but he turns around and eats the egg because there's a lot of nutrients in that egg. And then he'll start to eat uh, around the egg and make a nice hole in that milkweed leaf. Now he's, you can see where the stripes are going to be, but he's still not striped. He's probably maybe a day old. So eventually a monarch caterpillar looks like this. Uh, his antenna or filaments aren't very big yet because he's still very, very young, um, but they will eventually develop. A, a monarch caterpillar is going to do something five times in its life and it's it's going to molt or shed its skin. So this guy has just molted and he's now going to turn around and eat that skin. Just like he ate his egg casing, he's going to eat his skin also because there is nutrition in that skin also. So we'll see him molting here, I hope. they kind of contract. They know that their skin is getting too tight and they actually produce an enzyme that pretty much just dissolves that old skin. And uh, as they sort of accordionize, that skin travels to the back. You see the filaments or the antenna, they're laying flat against the caterpillar because they've been confined under that old skin. And you'll also see him waving his head back and forth, trying to get his face cap off that sort of a separate part of the skin. And uh, it'll come off, it'll come look like a little curled up black uh, yarn or fuzzball, but it takes him a while. He's gonna work pretty hard at this. And uh, finally, when his feet come out, they'll just sort of sit there for quite a while. And again, once they're finished uh, molting, they'll turn around and eat that skin. Remember, all of these things are going on in your backyard if you have milkweed. You may not see it. I've never seen this outside. This is something I had. And I, sh I should say that I'm, I'm no expert on monarchs. Um, I just started bringing them in when I thought that it might be interesting to see their life cycle and um, became sort of fascinated with them. I don't know everything about them, but I've learned a lot over the years. So um, he has made sort of a sticky pad that his legs are or his feet are stuck to so he doesn't um, fall over while he's molting because that's a lot of energy he's putting into that. 
and his back end is about to come free. And I don't think we'll even see him get his face cap off, but he did eventually. And it's kind of funny because they just leave their back end up in the air like that for a little while. And then, as I said, he'll turn around and eat that skin. And he's still trying to get that face cap off. And there he goes. And so their only job is really to eat. And they eat and eat and eat. So remember that tiny caterpillar that came out of that egg is now this big, maybe about two inch long fat caterpillar who is just about done eating. They'll eat the uh, stems, the leaves, They'll eat the buds on the flower. They will just eat like crazy. And when it's really quiet, you can actually hear them eating. I don't know if the sound is of them munching or what, but it's pretty fascinating. So when he's done eating, he's not gonna eat anymore. It's after about 10 to 12 days as a caterpillar, he's done. So now he's going to uh, create a little white sort of spider webby button and i think you can see it up here a little bit and that is um i always think of it as sort of a cross between a spider web and cotton candy uh, he creates that with his mouth and i keep saying he because at this point we don't know a caterpillar if it's a male or female it's impossible to tell and after creating this sticky web he will um uh, placed his what's called a cremaster. It's like a little stick that comes out at the back end and stick that into that sticky web. And then he hangs like this in that J shape, in this case it's a backwards J, um, in for about 24 hours. And you can tell that this is obviously not happening in my backyard. This is in a container in my three season room, which is where I keep them. Um, it's important to try to keep them at the same temperature that they would be in outside. So if you have it on your dining room table in the air conditioning, that's probably not ideal. The other thing I didn't mention was that um, I've learned a lot over the years. And one of the things I've learned is that it's there's a lot of predators and a lot of diseases among monarchs. And so one of them is something called OE. It's a parasite. It's Ophriocystic. Electrocera. We'll just call it OE. And um, so to get those, uh, get that parasite off of the eggs when I bring them in, I bleach them. And yes, I did say bleach. Uh, I'll give you some resources at the end that will show you or where you can go to see how you bleach them. You don't just pour bleach on these things, obviously. So I bleach every egg I bring in to kill this parasite, and I bleach all of the milkweed that I feed them. Uh, the other important thing to know is that you should not bring in any more caterpillars or eggs than you have milkweed to feed. I've seen people desperate for more milkweed because they brought in too many eggs or caterpillars, but you want just as many as you can really feed. Otherwise, you're just creating a tragedy. So hopefully this bleaching process will kill this parasite on the eggs and on the milkweed. Uh, and I also test every monarch before I release it. I'm not gonna show you how to do that tonight, but you can also go to, you can go to YouTube and find this kind of thing. Um, I just take a piece of uh, scotch tape, touch it to the abdomen, remove some scales. I looked at it, look at it under a microscope. And once you learn to identify the parasite, it's pretty easy. So again, um, I'm not gonna go into that tonight, but you can look on YouTube or um, some Facebook groups and you can find out how to do that. So this guy is hanging here for about 24 hours. And when he's ready, he straightens out his antenna or his filaments go um, really limp. And then you know something exciting is about to happen. As you can see, the skin starts to split behind his head. He contracts and contracts. And the skin is finally way up at the top. Now you can see that sticky mass that he's stuck to. And uh, you can see actually the stripes of the caterpillar, where the stripes were on the caterpillar, until he smooths out and uh, looks a little different. So now he's wiggled around until his skin has fallen off. So I'm going to show you a video of how this starts. So you can see he's just hanging there. And he's in a container in my house. Uh, again, this is going on in your backyard if you have milkweed. 
but uh, if you do bring them in and you learn how to do this and do it responsibly, this is what you'll see. And once he starts hanging like that and moving, you don't want to walk away because you're going to miss it. Do you see the skin starting to split back here? And it will just travel up his body until he's totally free of that skin. And we'll go to the next one, I think. So the skin is all the way up at the top now. And he needs to get rid of it because it's going to interfere with him if he doesn't. Occasionally, it won't fall off. And they do generally do just fine. But um, they contract and contract until all of that skin is up at the top. And this will show you just how strong that webby substance and that cremaster that sticks into it are because he's going to do some pretty serious dancing here to get rid of that skin he knows he doesn't want it anymore again i keep saying he we don't know we can't tell with a caterpillar if it's a male or female there is a way to look at the chrysalis it's really difficult and i have not mastered that um, i just can't i can't see it but there is a marking that is very faint so now he's gonna wiggle back and forth. I always say, I can't decide if this is really fascinating or really creepy, but imagine this going on outside. And he's probably, you know, outside in your yard, he's hopefully chosen a spot that's nice and solid and secure and protected. Um, they say, whoop, there it goes. And now he's he doesn't know yet that it's gone. So he's gonna to continue to wiggle. Um, they say that, only three to 5% of the eggs that are laid ever really become monarch butterflies. There are so many diseases and predators, um, spiders. There are wasps and flies that will lay their eggs in the little caterpillars. There's all kinds of things, but you know, that's nature. But we, if we do bring them in, we just wanna make them as healthy as we can and hope they're, that we're releasing only healthy butterflies. And that's why I do all the bleaching and the testing. So now he's gonna hang like this. After he smooths out, he's gonna hang like this for about 10 to 12 days. I just think this is beautiful. Uh, nobody really knows for sure what those gold markings are or what purpose they serve. There are a lot of theories, but I've never seen anything um, really uh, convincing or you know substantial to make me believe that particular theory. But it's a beautiful, creation of nature. When I raise these inside, um, I don't ever allow them to eclose or become butterflies over the monarchs because again, if they're diseased, or over the caterpillars, because if they are diseased, the liquid that will drip out of that chrysalis uh, will contaminate the caterpillars down below. Uh, this is also a large container. I think you, you don't want to have too many um, chrysalises in one area because when the butterfly comes out they need room to spread their wings they don't fly around much but they do need to spread their wings and um, dry out their wings so this is just uh, I wanted to show you this one because I think it's a good example of that that webbing or that we call it a silk button and um, how it's sort of uh, concentrated in this area but it's really spread all over the top of this container As I said, I don't like the chrysalises. I don't like the butterflies eclosing or coming out of the chrysalis over the caterpillars. So I move them and um, it's very simple. I tie dental floss around the cremaster. That's that, that hook that sticks into the webbing. And I just tie a knot and hook it up to a safety pin. And I put it in a mesh container. And all that is, is a laundry hamper from Bed Bath & Beyond. Uh, it does have, open handles on it so i had to uh, sew some tool material t-u-l-l-e over them so the butterflies wouldn't fly out when they come out now not this is not a case where all of these butterflies would be closed at the same time maybe one or two a day and then um, you know gradually they all will but as i said they have to make their chrysalis in a really secure safe solid place so a friend of mine sent me this picture. Do you see it? Mm -hmm. Under the stairs. <laughs> see that right there? He found a really good place. 
she was a little worried that he didn't allow enough room because when the butterfly comes out, it hangs down from the chrysalis. And she was afraid that he didn't allow enough room for him to hang and dry his wings. Uh, so she was going to come back the next day and move it. And before she could do that, he, he closed and flew away and obviously was perfectly fine. But that's the kind of place you find them. Um, when I'm cleaning the containers that I keep them in, I keep a pretty good count of which how many caterpillars I have in each container. And I only have a couple of containers at any given time. But um, I did make a mistake one time. I could have sworn there were eight caterpillars in this container. I took them out, cleaned up all the frass, that's the poop, and um, went to put them back in and thought, oh, wait, I thought there were eight, but I could only find seven. And a couple of days later, I looked up on the ceiling of my room that I keep them in and found that chrysalis up there. So it was an escapee. And I had to get out the ladder and the dental floss and pull him down and move him so that he would be safe. I could have let him stay there, but then I would have had a monarch butterfly flying around the room and that would have been pretty hard to catch. So they're wily little devils sometimes. When the chrysalis turns black, uh, sometimes if it turns black, it's diseased and you have to get rid of it. I have one like that right now that um, I know that I have to destroy. But when it generally when it turns black and clear and you can see the butterfly right inside it, that means don't go away because if you want to see it eclose, you want to be right there. So when this pleat opens and this cracks open right here and right along here, that's when you do not want to leave because that butterfly is ready to come out and you'll see that it um, uh, puts its legs out first and hangs on. I'm going to show you a video of it closing, but I want you to pay attention to something. So I'll explain it before we switch to that slide. Um, you know that a butterfly has a proboscis, which is like a drinking straw. That's how it gets its nectar and its nourishment. Uh, it's like a straight straw that sticks out of its head when it wants to. It curls up and is hidden away normally. And then when it's on a plant, it uncurls it. Moths and butterflies all do this. So when I show you this next slide or the video of the butterfly eclosing, pay careful attention to the um, proboscis because it's pretty interesting. It comes out in two pieces. It's like two pieces of thread. And for some reason, it comes out in two pieces and it has to be zipped together or knit together before it will function as a feeding tube. So to do that, the butterfly will uncurl it and curl it back up and uncurl it and curl it back up. And when it curls it back up into its head, there will be two kind of protrusions from its head that will be going back and forth like this. And those are called labial palps. And that's what knits that um, proboscis together. If it doesn't do that, it, will, it won't live. So again, this is in that mesh container, so, uh, but you're not looking through the mesh. So there's one leg out right there. And usually you see two legs. I don't, maybe his other leg was kind of more on the other side. Um, but his, his uh, chrysalis is totally clear. He's hanging on and the abdomen will fall out kind of first. And the abdomen will be very full of, um, it's called hemolymph, it's a liquid that they then pump into their wings. So there he is. And the wings are all crumpled up, of course. They've been stuck in that little chrysalis for a long time, 10 or 12 days. Let's see if we can see his proboscis coming out. He moves so fast, I can't use the cursor or the pointer to show you, but. Um, You'll see. And he swings back and forth and back and forth. This guy swung back and forth more than any butterfly I have ever seen. He is, I was told that that helps to get that liquid, that hemolymph, which is like the butterfly blood, into the wings to fill them out. And you see the proboscis kind of curling out of his head? You'll see it in a minute if you haven't seen it yet. Um, but he needs to hold still first. <laughs> And he's really going crazy. As I said, I've never, I, th I think he's swinging back and forth a lot. They, in nature, they wouldn't swing this much because they wouldn't be suspended from dental floss, of course. Um, they'd be 
uh, that uh, stem would be somewhat more secure. Maybe not more secure, but it would be um, it wouldn't turn as much. So there he goes again. And it's amazing that they can hang on, but their legs have little barbs on them, little tiny barbs. They don't hurt when they're on your finger or when you hold them, but um, they do attach to things really well. So there's this proboscis coming out and curling up and uncurling, and he's knitting it together. And I think he's gonna give it one last swing here. And as I said, I, I've never seen one swing back and forth this much. They, it takes, I would say, four to six hours for them to be completely dry. You don't want to touch them or do anything to them while their wings are drying. There he goes again. Um, and as I said, I test them, so I have to handle them when I release them. I have to hold them so that I can um, apply the tape to their abdomen to remove the scales. So I want to make sure his wings are totally, totally dry. And I know when he starts kind of flitting around that enclosure that it's, it's okay. But I always let him go for four to six hours. So he's going to swing some more. And on and on he goes. So um, this is a different one, but you get the idea. His wings are filling out a little bit. His abdomen, abdomen is still pretty chubby. Um, Maybe you can even see the barbs on his leg, maybe a little bit there holding onto the empty chrysalis. And then here's that proboscis. It comes out in two pieces, as I said, one, two. And by uh, curling them up and uncurling and curling them back into these labial palps, that's how they knit them together. Uh, and that usually happens within the first hour. So this is this is a different one, but you can see that his wings are fully uh, filled out now. He may be ready to go. Um, so I would generally just test them and release them, just let them go outside. Um, they, um, one of the things that I think is uh, important uh, when you test them is that if you test them and they are contaminated with this OE, um, parasite. As I said, you need to destroy them or euthanize them. I can't squish one of these things. I suppose it's probably the most humane, if that, you can apply that to butterfly, uh, humane way of doing it. But um, it was suggested to me, and I feel better about it, if I put them in a baggie and I put them in the freezer, and they say it just slows down their metabolism, and they drift off to la la land. That's how I like to think about it. But if I'm going to release it and uh, the weather's bad, I don't want to release it in a thunderstorm. And sometimes it'll storm all night and all the next day. A butterfly doesn't need, a monarch doesn't need to eat for the first 24 hours. But if I have to keep it longer than that, I need to feed it. So you can give it some honey water. Uh, there's a certain um, combination of honey and water. Don't just put some honey in water and hope it works. Uh, you don't want to make it too strong or too weak. They like watermelon. It's nice and juicy, and that proboscis can get down in there and get that juice right away. Or I always have a rotten banana laying around or one in the freezer that I can just mash up with a fork. And when you do, the um, liquid kind of gathers around the edges. I put it in a real shallow container, and there he is. Now look at this proboscis, nice and straight and just like a straw, and he's drinking up that liquid from around the edge of the banana. You might wonder why he's sitting right on top of it. I didn't put him there. Um, you would think he would sit off to the side and drink it, but that's how monarchs and how butterflies taste through their feet. So when I'm talking to kids, I always, or you know, talk to a school group, I always say, now go home tonight and take your shoes, off, shoes and socks off at the dinner table and put your feet in your food and just tell your parents that you're tasting your food before you eat it. I have <laughs> parents. Um, so he's drinking here. These are his legs. One, two, three, and there's a fourth one here somewhere that we just don't see. Of course they have six legs, but there are two that they hold up real close up to their body and they're called brush feet and you never see them really. They don't use them. I'm not sure. Maybe over the ages they've decided they don't need them, uh, but they do have six feet. And then this is his antenna or filaments right there. So 
once we know that the weather has cleared, he's ready to be released. Or she, we don't know yet. But now I know. I know that that's a male because of these spots right here. Those spots uh, will indicate it's a male. Um, some people think that there's it's a, a, a pheromone stored there. Uh, there are other theories. Again, that's not right. Not quite clear. The other way you can tell it's a male is that these lines in this sort of stained glass pattern are very narrow, very thin. But this is the dead giveaway, these spots. If they don't have the spots, then you know it's a female. So that's uh, a monarch on uh, cardinal flower, which is another great nectaring plant. These are all native plants. All the, nat all the plants I showed you are native plants. And we know this is a female because there are no spots here. And also because these lines are much darker and thicker. And the, the color of this monarch is a little different than the other one. It might just be the lighting. I'm not sure this was in sunlight and maybe this one was a little bit darker. But also in the fall, uh, the migrating migrating uh, group, the, the later hatching hatchlings or eclosings, maybe we should say, um, are sometimes a little bit different shape. Their wings are a little narrower and longer, and they are a little bit darker, I think. Uh, I just make sure that, you know, I, I point them southwest, speak to them in Spanish, and tell them to go to Mexico, and I'm sure they all make it. So there's a male right there. You see the spots on his wings. I think it's important for um, kids to know about this too. So all the kids in our neighborhood have learned how to raise monarch butterflies. And this is one of them is just holding this one on a stick. Um, hard to tell if that's a male or a female, not quite sure, because from the underneath side, it's hard. So here's little Olivia with one that she raised on a, putting it on a black eyed Susan. And here's Marcus. That's a boy, I can tell, because he's got little black marks there. My technical assistant, my daughter, is laughing next to me. Uh, Leah, stick your head in here. This is my daughter, oh. Leah. <laughs> Without her help, I couldn't have done this. But she's looking at these pictures. These are old pictures. These kids are, he's a junior in high school now. And the little girl I showed you is going to be a sophomore. But this is just pictures over the ages. This is Eva. And she was just having fun feeling those barbed legs crawl up her arm. So they're ready to go. I just like this picture because it shows how strong those legs are and how barbed they are to hold on to that smooth stick. He looks like he's just holding on for dear life. So um, as I said, goldenrod is a great plant in the fall. And I can tell this is fall because of the sticker that I put on him. So through the organization Monarch Watch, which is a function of Kansas University, uh, I get stickers from them beginning about the 15th of August. They won't even send them to you before that time. And uh, I register with them. They have a, they've got a record of the number, uh, the registration number on each sticker that they are sending to me. I place it on the Monarch when I'm ready to release them. And that's when I send them on their merry way to Mexico. There's a lot of information on that uh, sticker and it does not bother them. They can fly just fine. Uh, there's monarchwatch.org on there. There's a serial number, which indicates that if somebody finds it, that that started it with me in Crystal Lake, Illinois. Uh, there's a phone number. Um, you know, most of these, you know, millions of butterflies migrate to Mexico. Not, you know, not everybody makes it. But so if they find this maybe in Dallas, Texas, hopefully whoever finds it will see that sticker and then we'll uh, call or contact Monarch Watch and say, I've got this, uh, this is the information on it. And they know that the butterfly that I released in Crystal Lake, Illinois made it at least to Dallas. My goal in life is to have them find one in Mexico, but I haven't been told that has happened yet. There is a way of checking to see if your butterfly ever makes it all the way to Mexico. But you can imagine if this butterfly is flying, maybe the ones that start in Canada, flying 3,000 miles to outside of Mexico City up in the mountains. They need a lot of nectaring plants along the way. And their chances of getting there are, are fairly slim. So that's why we want to have a lot of eggs and uh, becoming monarch butterflies here so that when we send them on their way, we hope that they make it all the way to Mexico where they will overwinter. 
Uh, only the butterflies east of the Rocky Mountains go to Mexico. West of the Rocky Mountains, they go to California. There are reserves in California that they go to, but east of the Rocky Mountains from Canada down all the way uh, uh, through Texas and then into Mexico, they go to a certain area in Mexico, which is becoming smaller and smaller. We know that there isn't enough milkweed to sustain monarchs in the United States anymore. Uh, that's why their numbers are dwindling. Um, we know that farmers spray crops. We treat our lawns with chemicals, which are not good for them. Uh, people use a lot of pesticides and herbicides, which are not good for any insect. So we're creating a problem. Hopefully we're rectifying that problem uh, in the United States. But then when they get to Mexico, there's a big issue there. It's a big controversy about logging because they uh, overwinter in the Oyamel fir trees outside of Mexico City up in the mountains and um, they're being logged. And the logging industry brings a lot of money to those people in Mexico. But the tourism, the people going to Mexico to see the butterflies bring in a lot of money too. But those two groups are butting heads like crazy. And there's been some actual tragedies that have resulted uh, uh, from that. So uh, hopefully people will get their act together and protect the monarchs and still maintain the economy of Mexico. So this is what it looks like. A, 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 a tree in Mexico, once the monarchs get there, I've heard it said that sometimes they gather, there's so many of them that gather on a branch, it'll break the branch. So can you imagine how many monarch butterflies it would take to break a branch off of a tree when they weigh so little in the first place? They don't eat or they don't eat while they're in Mexico. Um, they do come down out of the trees to drink water, but mostly they just hang out in the trees. And then about maybe February, mid-February, they start heading back north. But the butterfly that leaves Mexico is not going to make it back to Illinois. It will mate, lay eggs maybe in Texas or maybe in Mexico still. And then that generation will travel further north, get a little further north, mate, lay eggs. And then that generation will go a little further north. Um, they say that generally we around here we get the third generation. Uh, I think maybe third or fourth. This year, I found my first eggs uh, late May, which was pretty early. And then for about two weeks, there was nothing. And everybody in the Northern United States was just saying, where are the monarchs? Where are the eggs? After about two weeks, I started finding eggs again. But um, in the Midwest, it has kind of recovered. But in the East, people in Pennsylvania and in that area are not finding uh, eggs or caterpillars so we're not quite sure what's happening but it doesn't look good for the monarch so again plant that milkweed and plant those pollinating or those uh, nectaring plants so we're going to see what uh what will be my what's on my bucket list someday when we can travel again i will uh hope to do this this is a video that it's a little cheesy at the beginning but it's good
Cool. So I want to thank um, the person who did that video. It's on uh, YouTube and he does a series called uh, Jungle Diaries and his name is Phil Torres. And I did ask permission and he granted me permission to use that. So he's got a, a series of, of videos about places that he's gone all over the world. So um, hopefully our monarchs that we, we uh, release here will make it all the way to Mexico and uh, we'll cross our fingers. So if you're interested, uh, in, you can go to monarchwatch.org. I'll show you that in a minute. And uh, that's the organization out of Kansas University. And you can become a Monarch Way Station yourself. Uh, you have to certify that you uh, have milkweed and nectaring plants in your yard, certain numbers and certain situations. And you do fill out sort of an application. And if you pass, you get a sign like this to put in your yard. So. Um, Monarch Watch is the organization I keep mentioning. It's a fabulous resource. Also, Monarch Joint Venture uh, is another great one. And as I said, just go to YouTube and um, search monarchs, or maybe you just want to see a certain phase of their life. You'll find all kinds of videos. There's one particularly good one that I was not able to use, and it was um, put out by Butterfly World in Florida. They have a beautiful, beautiful video that shows much better than I did here today the life cycle of the monarch butterfly. And so it's, um, I think if you just look for Butterfly World, you may find it there. And then there are Facebook groups. You can just, again, search monarchs. And um, I belong to one that has taught me a lot about um, monarch butterflies. So there's information everywhere, and it's just right there at your fingertips. So thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Debbie. I hope uh, you all have uh, become enthusiastic about planting more milkweed in your yard and, and, and nectaring plants. Those are some pretty amazing photos. That was pretty special. Thank you very much for your, your program. Um, here's uh, some other actions that you can do in what we've been talking about planting natives of all kinds, but particularly, of course, the the, uh, the milkweed in the spring. Uh, also spread the word, help other people recognize the value of them. The message is getting out a little bit. We had a time when farmers all had milkweed all around the edges of their, their farm fields, and those were helping the, the monarchs in their migration especially, and those have all been killed with herbicides, and so we're having to fill up the void now. Uh, you can get on to the Chicago Living Corridors uh, website and, and our, see our Facebook posts. Uh, Carol Rice puts up some pretty amazing, interesting things. Uh, or join one of the participating organizations that we listed at the beginning if you want to, if you already are developing good habitat and would like to get your gardens on the map. Or consider vol volunteering with Chicago Living Corridors. Go to our website and see about all the possibilities that, that you can do there. So, uh, and now I think we're going to, uh, well, I wanted to let you know about next month. Um, on August 12th, we'll have our third uh, webinar. And this one, uh, we had some requests for it. So we're going to do a program on identifying and controlling invasive plants uh, in this area. Uh, I'm going to be the presenter on that. And uh, again, it's Chicago Living Corridors that is uh, putting on these webinars. So if you, uh, will, you'll have a registration, a, temp, a potential registration uh, at the end of the program here. And if you sign up, you'll get a notice about it again in uh, d just before the August 12th and the sign up information. So that's how you'll get connected with it in the future. So here is Debbie's uh, email and some of these websites we're talking about in the Facebook. And now we would like to invite you to uh, let's take a look at any questions that you have for Debbie or for uh, the rest of us, uh, anything that's been written. So uh, Iris, are, do you have some of those ready to uh, ask Debbie? Yeah, I sure do. Oops, I'm sorry. I had two microphones there. Okay. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. 
Okay, excellent. Uh, so Debbie, we've had a number of folks uh, thanking you for the beautiful pictures, the presentation, very informative. So I wanna, uh, again, thank you for your time today. Uh, a couple of questions that we've had uh, come in. And uh, again, if you have others, uh, feel free to submit them in the chat box or raise your hand and I can uh, unmute you to ask your question. Uh, one question um, comes in uh, saying someone has had has attempted to plant milkweed um, many times, but has had issues with the milkweed germinating. Um, Debbie, do you have any recommendations there? Um, well, if you're planting it from seed, um, I've tried a variety of methods. Uh, it was suggested to me that, uh, first of all, gather the seed or get seed from somewhere, but it needs to go through cold stratification. So it needs to have sort of the same circumstances it would have if it was outside during the winter. So um, someone suggested um, just, you know, spreading some on the ground in the fall, maybe scratching the surface a little bit and scattering it. So I've tried that. Um, also, after the first snowfall, when it, the ground is wet and kind of frosty and, and a little bit of snow on the ground, just sprinkle some there too, because that would be a natural way for a seed to, um, you know, spread itself around. Um, so I've tried that. And um, this year I got a lot of little plants coming up. I was real successful with that, but the most successful method I've found is uh, I found on a web on a Facebook group um, where you um, basically cut a milk carton, a plastic milk carton in half, almost in half. You leave one side for a hinge, put dirt in there, sprinkle the seed in there, wet it just a little bit, put the top back on, duct tape the top back on, take the screw top off so that there's some air and water circulating and put it outside in about January. So I did several milk jugs full and I got more plants than I could ever have imagined. Um, mostly the rose or swamp milkweed was most successful. And then you take it out in the spring, maybe around April and plant it in the ground. Uh, it sounds crazy, but it really worked. So uh, it is hard to transplant milkweed though, especially common milkweed, because the roots go horizontally and you've got to dig a large circle around that plant if you're digging it up and trying to plant it that way. So that's what's worked for me. Okay, great, thank you. Um, you mentioned um, that you bleach uh, the eggs um, and milkweed that you bring inside. Uh -huh. uh, can you, or do you know off the top of your head, the strength of the bleach? Um, yeah, you know what, I, I don't want to, I actually still uh, have a list right by my laundry tub in the basement so that I don't goof it up. For the eggs, um, I leave them on a little bit of a leaf and I do not, you better look it up, go to Monarch Watch. It's about nine it's 19 teaspoons of water to one teaspoon of bleach, but the kind of bleach is very important. It cannot be the splashless kind and it can't be the concentrated kind. If you have concentrated, then the, then the, um, uh, it's a different number and I don't know what it is. I just use the regular kind. So um, yeah, it's 19. Oh, my technical assistant just brought me my instructions. So uh, for the eggs, it's 19 teaspoons of water to one teaspoon of bleach, and you put the eggs in there for 60 seconds. You gotta set a timer, because you don't want it any more than that. Swish them around a little bit, and then pour them through a strainer, because sometimes the eggs come off the leaves, and then um, rinse them three times. For the milkweed itself, it is um, whatever, however much you wanna do. I just put it in a bucket, and I put in nine and a half cups of water, to a half cup of bleach. And um, you can put in leaves or the whole stalk if you want to, but you have to have a container to do that. And you might have to increase the numbers, but those are the percentages. So, um, and that's for 10 minutes. And you swish them around and then rinse them three times. Uh, that's generally works for me. But again, that information I think is all on Monarch Watch. Uh, I think that's where I found it. So just double check my numbers though, just to be sure. Great, thank I'm you. Just, 
I might just add also to, to Debbie's information about germinating the seeds. If you aren't uh, wanting to do all that, uh, in the spring, Citizens for Conservation always has a native plant sale the week, first weekend in May, and we sell a lot of, of little milkweed plugs. So they are already in a little, a little tube. Uh, the roots are pretty well established in there, and you can just plant, re, transplant that right into the ground and have a head start rather than uh, starting in January, as she said, with the seeds. So either way. And the WPPC, the organization I talked about, does the same thing at their plant sale, which is the first Sunday in May at McHenry County College. Uh, of course, it didn't happen this year, but hopefully it will happen next year. And we always have milkweed, and that's a popular plant. So if you come, come early and head right for the milkweed first. <laughs> that's great. great. Thank you. Um, uh -huh. I also plugged the, uh, the registration link for the August um, webinar in the chat box uh, so click that while we're still connected here if you want to register um, for the August webinar and I think with that um, we are at eight o'clock so again I want to thank Debbie uh, for taking her time to present a beautiful presentation tonight uh, we have her contact information as well um, so if you have questions Debbie has generously offered to uh, take emails and I think Debbie, you had also suggested that uh, if someone's sending you an email to put monarch in the subject line, um, so it, right. it flags for your attention. Uh -huh. Great. Okay, well, thanks everyone. And we look forward to seeing you at the August webinar. Thank you. Bye. Bye all. Bye-bye.